Hi, I'm Nate, and you're watching Photo Learningism. Let's get into some classic bass visual effects and see how it's done in Caden Live. And if you like Caden Live and you want to find out about best practice configuration and getting your feet underneath you for starting for using that tool, I do have a book available for $5 out there as an ebook. It's called Every Tool You Need for Content Creation for Free. And of course, includes way more than just Caden Live. It includes a whole repertoire of tools you can use to get started on content creation. But the hard facts of setting up Caden Live are all there. Go check it out. Again, it's $4.99, $5 US. And I really appreciate you taking a look. Thank you so much. Let's start by unpacking the different layers here a little bit. I am working on a very, very basic green screen kind of idea. I constructed it out of some simple green poster board, which worked okay. Uh, you would get a lot better results if you used even lighting. I do not have tons of lights at my disposal presently, so I just kind of did a best fit operation, and I also had to suspend some things in a way that's not quite so desirable. But I made it work, and I'll show you how, how I did it. And to describe what is going on here, I did use a wide angle lens. And the trick here really is you have to shoot as wide as the camera will let you go. Because if you start zooming in to kind of get closer, so to speak, to the object, in this case, it's a smaller model of Legos, <laughs> it actually starts to detract from that grand scale look that you're trying to get. So if you have a wide angle lens, that's a great idea. But even if you don't, the trick really is you gotta pull the field of view as far back as you can and get as close as you can to the object to achieve that kind of grand flyby look. That's how that, that goes. Breaking down how the compositing and how the visual effects elements work here, let's start stepping into that. Now, I have the two layers here you've seen, one of which is space. Now, I found this for free out there on Pexels. Uh, there's some very interesting starscapes that are available for free. You can go use those as you need to. Uh, it's a great way to start. Now, I did do some things to this later just to kind of work with the motion I was doing. We have this video then, which is going to go over top of that. The, the order of things is important because it always works top to bottom in, when you're looking at compositing, meaning that if you're going to start making layers and bits transparent, it will keep the parts on top and then work its way to what's underneath it. I'm V1 is my background. V2 is the thing I'm working on. I could move that up further if I anticipated putting some other things in between. That's fine. Doesn't really make a difference. I want to introduce something I have not talked about previously. It's called the mask apply. And the reason this is important is that you can stack up a series of mask related effects and compile them with this mask apply. So a good use of that is using the rotoscope uh, process. And I'll, I've touched on that before, but before I get too far ahead of myself, let me show you. Mask apply is right in line with all the other effects. You just take that and drag that on like you would any other effect. And that has to sit in the stack underneath the effects that it's going to compile. I've mentioned before in other videos that the order of effects is important. It will work similar to the timeline top to bottom, but in this case, you would kind of specify the masking elements and then the mask applied takes all those and makes them one final polished thing. The next piece actually is rotoscoping. And you may ask why, because I put a green screen in. I'll, I'll get into that. <laughs> um, so you can use really either one of these. I tested them both and really could not find a significant difference between them. One of them is labeled as a mask. That's the one I used up here, but I tried using it for a similar use further down and didn't really see any distinctive difference. So I guess you can use either one. If you know of a difference, uh, put it in the comments below and let me know, but I could not find one. So drag that over and like any typical rotoscoping map, it's going to make you start with a shape and you have to draw out the points. You cannot add points later that I'm aware of. That's a little bit of a drawback, but you can do a lot with the things you put there. So the trick is really to put enough points to work with as you do this. And I'll show you what happens. So just to walk you through this, I'm going to drag this on. All right. And you'll notice the first part here, how there is no keyframe. Often it starts you with one, but this one doesn't have one because you have to create the first one based on points, based on geometry. So you'll start by left clicking right up here on the monitor 
and just drawing out the pieces that you need. And you may have to do this a couple of times to kind of anticipate and see how many points you're gonna need. Again, you can't add points after the fact, at least not in a way that I can see. So be generous with your points. It's kind of a balancing act of what's too many points versus what's enough. Because <laughs> the more points you put on, the more you have to manage. But you draw out and put around the thing, in this case, that we want to mask. And the final point needs to be a right click, just to be aware. All right, so that's a complete object. You notice we have our keyframe now. And from here, you just need to animate that mask. That the geometry of the mask, really. As the thing that you're masking moves, what you need to do then is move the points. Now, there are some shortcuts here that I wanna show you that make this a lot less painful. First off, I'm just gonna create another keyframe to work on. I can click and drag this X in the middle. That is actually the center point, or what's considered to be the center point of your mask shape. And I can move the whole thing that way without having to move an individual point. That's very useful to start with. Another thing, which is super helpful, is if I hold the shift key and I right click twice. <laughs> so shift, double right click, you can see how this changed a little bit. And I can use the shift lock as cold shift as I do it to kind of keep it in ratio as I drag it out. Or I can just drag a point without holding shift, which allows me to scale it in a different way. I can drag inside. This allows me to kind of rescale based on what's changed to a high degree. It saves a ton of time when you're trying to make a complex object like this rough fit. So you have that ability. And then when you're done with that, again, it's shift, double right click to put it back in this mode. And I can move the individual points then to better fit around what I'm trying to do. Now I'm gonna zoom in a little bit closer here using control and then the roller on the mouse. And you can see a little more clearly here how it has the Bezier curves and I can get a high degree of control and accuracy with bending the lines around the thing that I'm working on. That's really useful with things like this where there's contours and uneven shapes that need to be accounted for. So once that's been taken into effect, I'm gonna take away the one we just added, use the one that I've already preset and worked on quite a bit. The next thing to really tack on there is something called a key spill mop-up, which is also in the effects. It gets dragged on just like anything else. That needs to go next in the sequence, but over top the mask apply. So then the key spill mop-up, what that does is that it will look at the object, in this case, that has something to be chromid, and there's a little bit of light bounce. There's usually some green or some blue or whatever color screen you're using that will reflect onto the object. It's undesirable and you could get around this by putting more distance between yourself and the screen, but then that becomes a challenge of getting a screen that's big enough to isolate what you want and that, that can be difficult. So I was working under extremely tight circumstances and I just didn't have that option. So this is an idea where you can actually go back and clean up that spillover it's called. There was green on my Legos, I used this, and it has a couple different modes. It starts with B key and there's two operations and those are like passes really. Uh, but you, I'm using in this case to target instead of B key. You can use B key to kind of unchroma something as well. Uh, but for this use case, I'm using target and color distance. In transparency, you could take out more stuff as kind of a complement to a chroma key effect. Uh, but I'm using it to replace color that I don't want to be green. I found a middle ground of, of wash on it just by using the color picker. And then I decided I'd best liked it just tinted black. So once that's on, you can play with the tolerance and the slope is kind of the mix of what was there versus what you're applying. So you can work on that or you can also play with the hue and the saturation. And then the amounts one and two are correspond to the passes, the operations. Um, you could actually do one of multiple things if you wanted to dekey and target at the same time, you could do that too, theoretically. Um, but again, my use case here was just very much to get rid of that color spillover. And then once that's all set up and done and I found the, ha the happy mix of things, that now runs through itself to get into the mask apply. Now the next part is actually a good deal easier. I dragged in a just a general rotoscoping effect down below. 
and I can borrow all that work I've already done in this rotoscoping effect and bring it down. I can use these three lines and copy all keyframes to clipboard. I'm gonna truncate that. And then down here with the new one that I just added on, I don't have to start by making a shape, which would be the normal first process, but instead I can go to the three lines here, import keyframes from clipboard. It's going to assume just because it recognizes I came from a rotoscoping shape that I want to map. Again, the rotoscoping shape, which is super awesome. Map that to my new one. I don't really need to do any offsetting here. And that's good to go. I'm going to click OK. And you can see how it drew all those on for me. Now here, I'll just take this away again because I'm just demonstrating how I put it together. We're going to turn that one off. This is the one that I had built before. Here I did do some work to put some feathering on to kind of blend that a little bit because there is a little bit of spillage that it still can't account for uh, on the outer rim, even when I'm trying to do my best. You could get this really super tight if you spent the time on it. Um, but this is just what worked best for me. I did make several attempts going through it with chroma keying. By the way, you'll notice how there's an absence of direct chroma keying going on here. <laughs> but it did not get rid of a lot of these finer points. And I even tried a combination of rough mapping like you're doing here and then chroma keying and it just left too many artifacts doing it the way I did it. So I am doing a rotoscoping approach in this case, which did work very well. All right, so that was how I achieved getting at least really close into the object type, blending it a little bit more. That's pretty easy to understand based on what we've already established. The last piece of this is a despill, which is a little bit similar to the mop-up, except that we're focusing now on pulling out a range of color. And what I was able to do is pick out the parts that were remained that were really green and I didn't like. And because this is space, this works out to our advantage where I could take the green. It gives you two templates, either green or blue, because it's assuming you're doing one of those two chroma operations. Uh, and then tweaking that a little bit with brightness. I decided to back it off enough so that what it was turned black, essentially. You can filter out certain ranges of color based on what you have there and play with the mix and do all that. And I did some of that a little bit here, but for my case, it was actually just as well to turn it black, to turn the brightness off and make it black, just so it blended really, really well with what I'm doing here in space. And then with all that, you actually get to achieve your own model or spaceship floating through space like this.